Joining us now, the Deputy Labor Leader, Richard Miles. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah. Aaron. First of all, let's start with the focus of the Parliament. Bob Hawke, the 23rd Prime Minister of this nation, and I know one of your personal heroes. Absolutely. And uh, it's um, a big day. You know, it's a, it's a rare honour that both chambers of the, the Parliament are spending the entire day talking about Bob. But it's, it's as it should be, because certainly as I see it, I think Bob is really the father uh, of modern Australia. Um, I mean, we had the, uh, a compact of federation which saw us through most of the, the 20th century from the time of federation. It began to kind of be dismantled with the removal of the, the white Australia policy, but in an economic sense, it gets removed by the Hawke government. Um, and in its place, the, the, the architecture for modern Australia was, was put there. And so, you know, more than any other person who's graced this parliament, Bob Hawke really is the architect of modern Australia. Are there any particular anecdotes you remember? We heard some wonderful stories from... Even Scott Morrison had yeah. a few fond memories. Well, I, I, I became an officer of the ACTU in the year 2000. And, and Bob gave a lot of his time in retirement to the ACTU. He, he often noted that of all the places that he'd worked, it was the, the place where he'd spent most time. So I was lucky enough to get to know Bob just a little bit through that. Um, I, I remember the first time I had lunch with Bob was... Um, at the ACT Congress in the year 2000 in Wollongong. Um, I was very nervous, um, pretty starstruck actually, <laughs> about mm. spending some time with the great man. Um, but he was really engaging. He put us all at ease. Um, he was obviously interesting, but the, you know, for somebody of his stature, what really struck me was he was really interested in a generous way in, in us and the people around me, in our story. Um, and, you know, it wasn't long before we were hanging off his every word. But he was always a... a he, he was a great conversationalist. I, I, I thought a wonderful person to be with. Beyond the uh, the reforms that were undertaken, of course, he was a chairman of the board, so to speak, in terms of his cabinet. It was yeah. a, a very strong cabinet from Gareth Evans to John Button and, and many others, Paul Keating, of course, yeah. as well. But why was he able to connect with everyday Australians, because that was the thing. He won four elections. He was basically universally popular. He was a very popular figure. Why is that? Well, just on, on that first point, Kieran, because I think it, it, is, it is a really important one. Um, I, I suppose in my time as an MP and, and watching uh, prime ministers in government and then from opposition, it, it, the way in which you institute governance, I guess, of, of Cabinet and of the, the, the government party room... I think is probably the most important thing that a Prime Minister does. Um, and God, uh, uh, Bob was the gold standard in that respect. You're absolutely right. He had impeccable governance. And, and when you speak to people who were in his ministry, the, the, the kind of furness of that debate, the vibrancy of it, um, was what, 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 what... Well, firstly, it was very vibrant, but it's what drove that government. And it meant that they constantly pushed the envelope but got answers right. And, you know, I think there's a lot in that for governments to learn from uh, going forward. Look, he, he was... When you see the, 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 the newsreels of him, as we have in the last uh, couple of months since his passing, doesn't he just leap from the screen? You know, like, it, it, we, we talk about now chasing authenticity, um, mm. but, Bob, it, it, it's, it's there writ large. Um, he wears his emotion on his sleeve. There, there is nothing confected about it. He's... Yeah. he's um, it, 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 it is so... I mean, the energy is palpable, and, you know, oh, that we could bottle that and, and, and drink it ourselves, but he... he I mean, I think that, that that's part of it. And I think it is just being a really extremely honest with your emotions. The... Um, the, the feeling of grief that he had in relation to his daughter, but then in relation to Tiananmen. I mean, that, that, there's not many people who are willing to really open that up to, for everyone to see, and, and, and yet he did. But also, you know, the, the passion that he ex exuded in, in a range of speeches that he made, um, you know, you couldn't help but fall in love with it, and people did. Moving on to news of the day, we're back with a new sort of new government. Um, what's your priority for dealing with this Scott Morrison government? How are you going to, in particular, I think we're quite interested in the Medivac legislation that's coming up. There's any chance that it could be repealed? Oh, well, uh, I mean, um, if, if the government are going to that, um, it's just the government playing politics, as we have seen them do, frankly, with, with the taxation uh, legislation as well. I mean, this is a government which is less about governing Australia and more about trying to pick a fight with us. But uh, the answer to your question is uh, w we're going to hold them to account. Um, over the next three years, we will be 
uh, making it completely plain what this government is and what it is failing to do in meeting the challenges that are presenting themselves to Australia today. Um, and you only need to look at the, the flagging economy, the, the, the decision of the Reserve Bank yesterday, which is a, really highlights it, the fact that we've got interest rates now one third of what they were during the global financial crisis. This is not a good government. It's not a government which is managing Australia well, and we certainly intend to... So, in, to, in the context of uh, the, Dr Lowe's statements on the economy, do you, do you support his implied message that maybe the government should put its its focus on the surplus to one side and, and now borrow more to spend on infrastructure and do it now because the, the economy needs it? Well, the economy needs um, a boost, there's no doubt about that, and we've been talking about bringing forward... Um, and an infrastructure package, that that's what the government should be focused on. Not, not, so, not so much on the surplus? You well, well, think that that's as uh, pivotal? Uh, well, um, I mean, it's important that the government um, uh, is fiscally responsible as well, but I think this can be done in the context of maintaining a surplus. But we have been arguing about an infrastructure package, but we've also been saying, um, let, let, let's bring forward stage two of the tax cuts so that every Australian gets a tax cut this week. Uh, because we need to be putting money in in the pockets of Australians. That would have been right a good now. message a couple of months ago, though, wouldn't well, it? It, it? Would well, have been it, good in before the campaign. Yeah, well, uh, well we're, we're, uh, Karen, election. I'm. Uh, there's a lot that we need to work through, obviously, in terms of what occurred on on 18 May, um, and we've we've spoken about that, and and, and we'll do that. But in the here and now, um, we need to be getting money into the pockets of Australians, and that's why this week. Um, we're saying let's bring forward uh, stage two of the, the tax cuts, not from 2022 after the next election, three years from now, but let's bring it forward right now, this week, um, so that we can get money into the hands of people and get the economy going. Isn't it hard for Labor, though, to be saying that the government needs to change the tax plan, push these changes forward to get more money into Australians' pockets, when you still haven't formally dropped policies like changes to franking credits or negative gearing, which does take money out of the pocket of average Australians. Well, uh, look, what we've said in relation to the, the, the policy suite that we took to the last election is we're, we're starting again. Uh, you know, everything is, is on the table for review. Um, and we will go through a, a really thorough process about uh, what occurred in, in the election. And, you know, it's obviously a difficult, really difficult moment for us. Um, and, and the hard... Thing that we need to acknowledge and embrace and own, ultimately, is that the propositions that we put to the Australian people were rejected. Um, so that, that requires us to do an examination of that, and we'll do it. Um, but right now, um, there is an issue in front of the parliament this week. Uh, only yesterday, we have the Reserve Bank saying that, uh, that in order to get the economy going, they're reducing interest rates to one third of what they were during the global financial crisis. Um, we have the opportunity in the next 48 hours um, to put uh, money into the hands of uh, Australians by bringing forward the Stage 2 tax cuts. Let's do that. And in terms of the tax cuts more broadly, I, d I don't see a scenario in which Labor could leave Canberra on Friday without having those through the Parliament. You don't want this to be hung around your neck for the whole term, surely, that you got in the way of of tax cuts and the stimulus that you've been arguing is needed by the economy? Well, Kieran, we're focused um, over the next 48 hours and speaking to uh, the crossbench of the Senate about the merits of splitting off Stage 3 and making sure that we deal with Stage 2 and Stage 1 right now and that we bring Stage 2 forward so that everyone gets a, a tax cut do you, right do you, now. Do you see the government's argument about, you know, having certainty, business needs certainty? Don't income earners, don't average day, every, every day workers need certainty in terms of their planning and, and with the government's longer term plan, they've got certainty as to what tax bracket they'll be in. Uh, we're for certainty, but I'm not sure that the government uh, is providing it with this tax plan. I mean, I mean stage three uh, costs $95 billion. I mean, that's a phenomenally big number. Uh, it, it, it sort of rolls off the tongue a little too easily, but um, it's a number which implies a reshaping of the Commonwealth, to be honest, um, and they've not argued how that's going to occur at all. So there's nothing certain 
that goes with the stage three tax cuts. You can't, you can't put that up with a one word of being responsible without explaining what cuts go with it, what services aren't going to happen, um, what's going to happen to health and education as a, as a result. Uh, in actual fact, that represents a whole heap of uncertainty. Um, and, and our point is that that's a debate which needs to be had in full with the full information provided to us and to the Australian people. Right now, though, we don't have to have that debate. We're talking about a change that the government is proposing in 2024-25. We don't need to do that this week. But we can act this week in a way which actually gives money into people's pockets right now. Just finally, do you agree with Ed Husick's comments that having a budget surplus is just a vanity exercise? Oh, look, I, I, I understand that um, the, the government is, is seeking to uh, put in place a surplus. Um, it does matter to be fiscally responsible. We've certainly sought to be fiscally responsible as well. Might I say, in terms of bringing forward stage two, you can do that and provide people with that tax break right now in a way which would still deliver the surplus. Richard Miles, we appreciate your time. Deputy Labor Leader, thanks so much. Thank you.